you could understand that common law private trusts could help you design generational wealth. I have the pleasure to introduce you this morning to Howard Hinneman. He is a senior paralegal, and today we're going to have a friendly conversation as two friends in a coffee shop about private common law trust. None, none of the following will be construed as legal, financial, or investment advice, as well as sports advice. It's just going to be two associates having a chat at a virtual coffee shop. Welcome, Howard. Which I ought to include tax and sports advice along with financial advice. In yes, any case, yes. <laughs> the, whole, the, whole, the whole point is this, that with an irrevocable common law trust, the non-wealthy can design a situation where they can build over three, perhaps four generations, general generational wealth or legacy wealth, depending on what you want to call it, and avoid the rags to riches to rags syndrome over three generations that we see far too often in North America, Canada, and Europe. And actually, this is what the very wealthy do. They set up a situation where they provide their people with the personnel, the procedures, and the resources to do it. It's no secret. We are exposing it right now. Yes. And there was a book, uh, I remember when my parents were growing up, called Catcher in the Rye. So you got to be a part of a team that... Uh, um developed a book and I, I'll leave it in the show notes and I don't necessarily want to focus on the controversy of the book, but rather the education in this conversation, right. because there's a number of family businesses that need this education. Uh, in addition to the fact that today about two thirds of today's affluent are self-made. So they might not have had this conversation growing up at the kitchen table or the dining room table. So if we were to start at the basics, Howard, what is a trust? What is divided title and what is an indenture? Okay. Disclaimer, I am not a contributor to the book. The book was written by about 12, 10, 12, 14 authors. Some of them are alive, some of them are no longer alive. Essentially, a trust that goes back to Roman times. It was first used when the Roman soldiers were going off to war, and they would entrust the affairs of their family to a trusted friend who was not going off to war with them. So a trust has to, has has the has legal title and equitable title. Basically, the trustees manage the property for the benefit of the beneficiary. The key thing about trust is they are for the benefit of the beneficiaries, whether they're human whether they're animal, whether something else, a piece of property. For instance, when I was growing up in Anaheim, California, they had the East Anaheim Cemetery, the old Anaheim Cemetery, which back, went back to the founding of Anaheim. It's called the Mother Colony. German immigrants who made wine, later oranges, and when there was some kind of a wine blot, that's why it's called Orange County, California. And essentially... That was managed by a trust, a cemetery trust. There's about 17 types of trusts in common use. Yes, and I know a part of the history also went back to England. If the Knights Templar were going to go away, and they had to figure out how to make sure their land and you're uh, nodding. Yeah. So would you like to share the story before we get into pirates? Okay. Essentially, we have a situation where Similar thing, people going off to the Crusades, England being the, the birthplace of the common law, the Magna Carta, and basically they would again entrust the property to the care of some trusted person to, to manage affairs while they were gone. And that's where this comes from. A trust is a fiduciary relationship like many other fiduciary relationships. Yes, and I think one of the reasons also I, I wanted very much for you to be a guest speaker on this podcast is that the two books that you've been a part of in terms of the team has broken it up into the personnel, the procedures, and the resources. And I think uh, most of this conversation is going to focus around volume one. And I came across your work in 2013, and it's helped uh, my life uh, tremendously in being able to put, pull the resources together and the trust indenture. So I know that this subject matter works, but again, I'm going to provide the disclaimer. This is garden variety information. This is not to be construed as legal advice, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I, I just wanted to um, 
uh, highlight that we're going to talk about the fundamentals of trust operations in the next uh, 50 or 60 minutes or so. Okay. okay. We publish two books, Art of Passing the Buck, Volume 1 and Volume 2. Volume 1 is for everybody written about 8th, ninth grade level in the U.S. And then volume two for the student and the professional in the field. And that has essentially all the, the trust blueprints. It has banking minutes, sample board of trustees minutes, sample uh, exchange proposals, and has everything except the trust indenture. It does not have trust indenture. We also have a premium subscription newsletter, which is a great value at $80 a year. It comes out every other month. And that really keeps you up to date in the area of the irrevocable common law trust. Yes. So tell me about pirates, Howard. Uh, so in volume two, there was a metaphor about how many times people need to learn how to work together today in terms of the cohesion, whether it's a family that's pulling together their resources. And you had a great metaphor. And I know that many people uh, in terms of listeners have seen Pirates of the Caribbean with the, the wonderful set of actors within right. that movie. But there's a mindset of if we can all work together, then we can share in the fruits of the labor. Got it. Not only pirates, but privateers. This is I'm, I'm somewhat of a naval history buff. And you have a situation where essentially everybody was paid a percentage of the booty or the take, the, pr the prize. In other words, so basically there was an incentive built in to work together. And basically pirates would get a percentage. The captain gets the most, et cetera, et cetera. The investors always got something. It's very important. Investors, are, which would be in the case of a, a irrevocable common law trust, would be not stockholders, shareholders of either trust capital units or universal benefit units of beneficial interest, UBIs, TCUs, UCIs, UBIs. They would get paid. I think the smallest that was paid on a privateer was like the cabin boy to the captain was paid the smallest percentage. And then if you went up the line, you would be paid. And then if you fired the shot that dis disabled the, the rigging that got it, you got a bonus. Yes. Well, I think one of the reasons why I wanted you to bring up the story about the pirates or the mindset isn't necessarily taking over some ship in the Caribbean, <laughs> but rather that uh, these days people can oftentimes have a scarcity mindset and not be willing to think about the bigger picture where everybody wins. And there was even a, a, a portion, I think it's in volume two, where you had mentioned that even let's say there's if there's a family member and they might not be good at making the money to not cut them out just because they don't have the art or the the uh, the gift or the talent of commercial activities you know still bring them into the fold of the trust make sure that there's something that they can do so that they're not just left out uh, where greed or pride or ego wins within the context of hey. a larger family unit in terms of generational hey. wealth again as the famous mathematician John Vinoman said, always set up a win-win situation. This goes back to somebody named Michel de Montaigne, a French author, who said basically it, it was he believed the world was a zero-sum game. His opening his quote was something like, No one gains except through the loss of another. And that that was in the late Middle Ages, early Renaissance, and that spread, and that's believed. Again, it wasn't until John Van Neumann came out in the 1950s. He was a, one of the computer pioneers. He was the one that had that, and that's the whole understanding. There's, there's three possibilities. There's a lose-lose game, which you want to avoid. There's a win-lose game, which you also want to avoid. You want to set up win-win games, and the irrevocable common law trust is the way to set up the family affairs to set up a win-win situation and to make sure that all family members are properly taken care of, again, with the personnel, procedures, and resources. Absolutely. I know one of the things that uh, the book highlights and and a part of our, our, our prior conversations, communications over email is oftentimes there can be a generation and it's almost as if they start from scratch. So the idea is, why don't you put a couple of coins in their pocket 
so that they don't have to start from scratch regarding entrepreneurialism in America or beyond North America. And so there's this idea of that through trust, when the trust is set up properly and somebody understands all the different components that go into the indenture to the trust binder, where the minutes are done properly and and um, and everybody understands the roles of who's 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 on first, who's on second, and so forth. So the roles being the settler, the grantor, the the two trustees, which we're going to get into. But I think that this speaks into the challenge of having the next generations not start uh, from scratch. You know, oftentimes I've, I've spoken into this idea that the head start is the head start, but sometimes people don't know how to get to that head start. The solely as a paralegal, the irrevocable common law trust can be used with appropriate modification in any common law country and any or or area could be a region or any such item place which will recognize a common law situation. For instance, Mexico has imported LLCs, although under, under civil law, that's not a concept. However, they do do that. And I, we did have somebody, I do not know if he was, he was successful, was having to import uh, the year of old common law trust in Mexico. I do know in Mexico, they do use land trusts for uh, things like because you're not only Mexican citizens can allow can own land within so many miles of the seacoast and so many miles of the border. So for all those Americans and Canadians, the snowbirds in Baja, California, Norte and Sur, they basically can they can own property through a land trust, essentially. Uh, that's yes. possible. It, now, the Frank Ozak, the late Frank Ozak, who's been gone now for 13 years now, in fact, over oh, more than 13 years, he said the ideal way to do this would be to, uh, when the person was late in high school, early in college, would be to, to give them a whole series of five or six jobs to see which ones they liked and were good at. And the family would would in their in their family trust would have positions or would find positions that they would make connections with and see some people are good at things. Sure, sure. You know, you know. Would you speak for a moment into what you've seen? And I don't know if you remember this from top of mind. Would you speak into entrepreneurialism in America and the true numbers? Uh, America has been one of the most entrepreneurial companies, along with our, our, our brothers to the North Canada, our neighbors to the South in Mexico, Australians, New Zealands, uh, English, Irish. In fact, most of our customers and the person we're looking to reach are small business peoples, farmers, and ranchers. Because we would like them to be able to keep their family business intact, keep their family farm or ranch intact, and not become sharecroppers. Sure, sure. I think in the book, one of the things you mentioned is that in America, the idea of entrepreneurialism is that not as many entrepreneurs succeed as we're led to believe these days. And so, go ahead. Were you going to comment on that? I was surprised well, about the statistics. Uh, I, I just... Thought I'd bring it up. <laughs> okay. We have part of the reason we have mass production through Henry Ford, the the senior, not uh, Henry Ford the second, his grandson, is because Henry Ford failed at farming. He was a lousy farmer, and he he, he said, "Hmm, I better do something else." So basically. Henry Ford, he had this, this was new thing called the horseless carriage. And he got, he was in 1903, he had some backers and then comes along and there's the model P and then the model A. And Henry Ford is the man who put America on wheels more than anybody else. So yes, it's, it's possible. Uh, the Wright brothers were successful, and that's Orville and Wilbur, were successful entrepreneurs in bicycles. And they followed this thing called the heavier-than-air machine. Uh, they corresponded with Otto Lilienthal, the German pioneer, what, what would essentially be hang gliders, who tragically died. And they basically, uh, you can go to 
the right, uh, let's call it a national monument in Dayton, Ohio. And there it is, is you can see their bicycle shop, which became the first flying. And they, it took them, and let me address, this is very important, Angelina. Basically, you have a situation where the Wright brothers were not successful for years. They were disbelieved for years. What they did was they would go out, they'd, they'd go out, uh, they had the, uh, the flying machines were kept at the far end of the tram line in a field. And they have breakfast and take a picnic lunch and five sets of pair, spare parts. And they go out every day and it was either they ran through all the parts or it was dark and they came back. People looked at them and they didn't believe their eyes. They didn't believe their ears. They didn't believe the smell of the gasoline engine. It was only when they went to France like three, four years later, they became successful, and it was became apparent that the Wright brothers, Orville and Rubler, had conquered the air. In other words, yes. if you're if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you risk not only financial failure, you risk reputational failure. <laughs> yeah, you can say that again. <laughs> it's but true, if it's, you don't, but if you don't take those risks and those leaps of faith, then then nobody grows. Your family doesn't grow. You don't grow, and society right. as a general, okay. uh, as in a general right. rule, doesn't grow. So there, there is a fellow whose work, work I recommend, Jay Stewart Snelson of, of late the late Jared Snelson, also a Toastmaster as am I. He said human progress depends on three classes and three classes of people: entrepreneurs, technologists, and investors. That's it. And if you example of, if you look at a, a musician who's attempting to make it big, he or she is all three in one. They're the entrepreneur, they're the technologist, and the investor. Yes, yes. So, lovely. Thank you. And so, um, let me go back for a moment and connect our conversation with entrepreneurialism and family businesses to trust. So many times people will know about a grant or trust, perhaps a statutory trust, but this idea of a common law irrevocable trust is not often talked about or even written about. So I, I want to go back for a moment to the trust indenture. What is a renewal period? Why is this important? And who, who uses this without naming names? It is alleged that a number of European and American families have irrevocable common law trusts or other similar financial documents. There is, as solely as a paralegal, some jurisdictions have a rule against what are called perpetuities. Uh, and the purpose of that was to keep land from being locked up for generations, particularly in England. So usually the longest you can have a statutory trust is, let's call it right at 95 years. It is the lives of people that living plus 21 years to allow for any yet born children who are in the womb. Uh, for instance, and there's two clauses. There's the, the Royals Clause and the Rockefellers Clause. And that says, hi, the people we're going to set by are these famous people. The Royals Clause is more common because, quite frankly, the, the, the British royal family is a very long-lived. For instance, uh, Queen Elizabeth lived to be like 96. Her mother lived to be 102. Charles is in his, he was born in 1948. And he has children and grandchildren. So again, it's, that's the Royals Clause. And, and, and then that, because they're the lo longer lived than the other family, that's the one I would use, again, without giving any legal advice, it's because they live longer. So yes. There are some jurisdictions like Nauru that have abolished the rules against perpetuity. However, it's better to have a renewal period 20 25 years 20 if you're being conservative 25 if you're being not conservative not cautious to say hey 
has this trust grown to where it continues or is it shrunken unfortunately to the point where it'd be better to dissolve it and distribute the assets yes well i think this uh, point is important to bring up because oftentimes he or she who writes the contract writes it in their favor so if somebody can know about uh, the subject matter of a renewal period uh, why not research it in their due diligence to know to write it in and to study it and to look into it um, so that it can be a part of the foundational paragraphs of that trust indenture. So my next question for you, Howard, since uh, you've been a paralegal since 1997 and you've been uh, so kind as a mentee to come onto my podcast, what is the difference between a statutory and a common law trust? A statutory trust is a creature of statute as modified by court decision and could be changed, abrogated, canceled at the whim of whatever legislature or whatever law making authority exists in a jurisdiction. Which in the Commonwealth would eventually would, would currently be the king. Although the actual things are done by the prime minister the first minister to the monarch. Uh, in, the, in the United States, it's going to be your legislature, typically at the state level. They could pass a law that would say, hey, uh, we're, we're not going to allow trust. Now, because the irrevocable common trust is a creature of contract and protected under Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution, the right to contract it is permitted anywhere in the United States and its territory, even in Louisiana, which is a civil law state. Because Louisiana came in in the uh, purchase from, from Napoleon Bonaparte to by Thomas Jefferson, negotiated by Thomas Jefferson back in 1824. And then you have the great Lewis and Clark expedition, et cetera, et cetera, Western expansion, the whole thing. Yes, yes. I know one of the points that your books make is to set aside six months to two years to really build out the foundational documents of a common law, irrevocable trust. And But more so, you've spoken to this idea of quietly building your castle or your trust over three generations. It, it might take four. The point is that if you start in your 20s, for all the business owners, all the farmers, all the ranchers out there, Start now, and your grandchildren will be smiling. Okay. Do not wait. Do not wait until you're in your fifties. Yes. Start now. I mean, start, start, start as fat as rapidly as you can. However, it's better if you start early to give your your children and your grandchildren, your great grandchildren, a legacy, and then give them generational or perpetual wealth. Absolutely. And one of the key points you've also made is educating the next generation to handle trust knowledge and responsibilities. When, uh, again, the late Frank Ozak would say when they're 14, 15, 16 years old, you let them sit in on board of trustees meetings to understand what's happening in the trust. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's, I think it, it's it's like the famous Tom Swift series, Tom Swift, the new Tom Swift Junior Adventures, uh, Victor Appleton the third, I think. Basically, you know, young Tom Swift was was at you know at the family table with Tom Swift Senior, and learning how to be a great inventor. Yes, and I think one of the uh, important reasons, again, of why I wanted you to speak into this idea of trust and the knowledge about trust that you have is because if somebody didn't grow up uh, talking about it at their dining room table or the kitchen table, even something as simple as vocabulary words, um, never mind uh, joining their parents within uh, the context of uh, a meeting with the CPA or the attorney and so forth, you know, they they have an opportunity now, but it's going to be such a, um, a concept that I hope that today's conversation can be an introductory discussion to help introduce them so this, that this idea can be less scary and they're willing to look into it further. It is, as Gwen Wyckoff would say, 
people look at it and say, this is a whole foreign world. However, it has a language which can be understood with study and diligence. It is a slightly different word. However, a common law, ir irrevocable common law trust is a trust. It's simply a variety of trust. The way Social Security is a trust. The way the Teamsters Pension Fund that built a number of hotels is trust. Same principle, simply a specialized type of trust. Yes, yes. And I know... And of course, and ahead, of course the, yeah, go ahead. the rabbi's trust, which is a trust for a clergy person's retirement, thus named because it was first used by a rabbi. Yes. Um, you've also mentioned blind trust, which politicians who run for office or serve in public office oftentimes have. But but most of us are not knowledgeable about that. It, again, doesn't come up in a dining room conversation. And yet we're, we, we, we live around trust, but, but so few of us have this knowledge or are willing to bring it up in a conversation, but just as much as legacy doesn't come up in the public consciousness these days. Right. Uh, Mitt Romney's father, George Romney, before he became a politician, was the head of American Motors, which eventually was bought up by Renault, and it's now the remnants are part of Stellantis Chrysler the Chrysler Fiat Group. He, when he ran for governor of Michigan in the early 1960s, put all his assets into a blind trust that's part of the public record. And he was a very wealthy man. But was so Mitt Romney had a head start. And he's been a governor of Massachusetts and a senator from Utah. Yes. And he came, and he came from a good family background. Well, I think uh, it, similar to him and some other politicians of some of the political families of the United States of America also have some of this knowledge where um, they realize that there is both protection um, as well as tax benefits. And um, so let me ask you this question. What are the consequences or dangers when not creating a trust thoroughly and putting the time in ahead of time at the onset? Okay. It generally takes, depending on the state or, or territory between two to three years to properly season a trust. Though it's important that the assets be properly transferred. And there's an old saying, nothing in the trust exists unless it has a document that documents it and a financial note that supports it. It's not real as far as the trust. Period. Okay. Okay. So I think sometimes people have this idea if they can buy a trust off of somebody else, then they can cut a corner. And I think that what you're suggesting is that they need to dive in, get their hands dirty, understand every component, or um, realize that that could come back and haunt them. Uh, whether it's the IRS coming to seize uh -huh. assets or just, again, if somebody takes a shortcut, they're kind of, you know, putting the heart cart in front of the horse or the ho or however that expression is. Okay. Frank Ozak had an expression, the first trust you're going to buy is going to be a scam. But we saw, particularly in the Southeast, it would start like in Kentucky and go further south into Georgia, that part of the world. People were selling trusts to others where the trust promoter was the beneficiary. And if you did not read the trust, you were putting all your assets into that person's name as kind of a bonus besides whatever they charged you. Up front. It's, it's, like, it's like anything, make sure you read the agreement and understand it. How many people signed their end user license agreements without even reading them? <laughs> They're useless. I mean, literally, you click here. Right. Did you read it? What did you agree? Did you agree to give your first board and your second born to them? Sure. Well, I, I don't know how many people read the notices that even come in the mail from the utility <laughs> companies. Huh. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I, I, well, hey, they, we sent you the notice. It's like uh, in um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. 
We posted the notice at Alpha Centauri. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I, I, I think most people don't even realize that uh, when somebody receives a notice that the onus is on them to take responsibility in reading it, because then now the other party can say, well, I'm indemnified. I provided you the communication in the form of a notice and you chose to ignore it. And and I think that's where this idea of ignorance, dare I say it, then hurts somebody in terms of designing a long-term legacy or what you had called that generational wealth. So. And to, ha to have your plan and work your plan and then modify the plan when appropriate, like anything else. Yes. This, okay. is, this, is, this is not rocket science. So um, in... Oftentimes within a trust, a grantor is the one that writes the indenture, correct? Could be or would get a trusted advisor to write the indenture. Okay. Okay. And after they write it, if it is a living trust, they would pay the taxes. Whereas in a common law irrevocable trust, the trust then handles the taxes. I just wanted to make that distinction This is a p particularly appropriate in North America. I do not claim it's appropriate in all common law jurisdictions. Okay. Um, what other distinctions tax-wise would be important to bring up right now regarding setting up the structures? It's important that the it's called Rockefeller versus Rice. It's a New York appellate court from 1930. It's important that the trustees in an irrevocable common law trust be truly what are called adverse trustees. They're, and their interests are aligned with the beneficiaries. They may not be an employee of the grantor. And that okay. site is on the website www.passingbucks.com that destroys the entire notion of the of, of the trust again www.passingbucks.com Rockefeller v. Rice New York Appellate Course 1930 the also the the, the case it is uh, upholds is uh, New York is California Appellate I think it's fourth Appellate District. It's out of Los Angeles. It's called Goldwater versus Altman. It's from 1927. It has to do with oil well syndication in Santa Fe Springs and Signal Hill. And if you know Signal Hill, California, I've actually, I've actually yes, California, I've actually seen Discovery Hole Number One. It is on the northeast side of Signal Hill, which is a separate city uh, surrounded by Long Beach, and that is the Tide Tidelands Oil development. And as a Toastmaster, I've been in the Petroleum Club in North Long Beach for the Five Sisters, Tex what were then Texaco, Humble, Union, Mobile, and Shell, and it is a nice club. It's like an English gentleman's club. Yes, yes. So while most people might not have the time for self-exploration because they're so busy on the mouse wheel, uh, those that are willing to set aside a couple of hours either in the evenings or the weekends to, to learn more about trust, one of the distinctions you make is it is the duty of the trustee to know how to maintain privacy. It is recommended in our trust, in, in not our trust, in the Interlocal Common Trust, that the trustees and all the trust personnel take an oath of privacy to keep every all the affairs private. Let, let's give me a horror story. Let me give our, you and our listeners a horror story. On statutory trust, you lose privacy. You can There are some trusts where they actually will publish the names and addresses of the beneficiaries. Let's say John Doe puts up a tr sets up a trust for his children and tragically dies. And basically, hey, gee, this he's got two daughters, one's four and one's two. And so every scam artist in that state and the five, six, five or six neighboring states go, hmm, let's track her when she goes to college. And we'll romance her, and I'll marry into the family and get the money. A patient scam artist. 
Well, they're talk. watching from the sidelines. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that, that's the biggest danger in some ways of the statutory trust is you lose your privacy. And on the flip side, uh, one of the, let's say, one of the components of some of the trust indentures, that is, if a, a beneficiary talks, they could be uh, cut out. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's yes. very important. It's very important that that be kept private to protect the entire operation of the trust. Yeah. And all there, its beneficiaries. And there, all was the trust a, there was another point that was made regarding, let's say, if the trust business is in a particular industry, the beneficiaries cannot then invest or any of the uh, trust officers in a competing industry. And I think that's also that something uh, somebody could take notice of, you know, if they're going to sit down and write that trust indenture for their family, um, that's going to be within kind of the rules and the regulations in terms of context. It is alleged by others, and I have no knowledge of this, the reason we do not have what I call breakthrough energy, and there are websites to that, one's called e-catworld.com, is because the trusts that benefit the oil wealth families of North America specifically do not allow investments in such items. I have no idea if that's true or not. I believe we're on the verge of a breakthrough in that area based on my, because I've been researching that area independently since 2012. Yes. And um, another point that the books made um, in terms of that the trustee has to have the backbone to understand privacy is if, let's say, um, there's an agency and they knock on the door and they say, knock, knock, we need to come in. It, to have the ability to say, I'll be pleased to meet you out in the courtyard or the lobby or the local coffee shop right. because yeah. of this idea of uh, if they ask you, well, first of all, if they come in, then they can describe what's within the, let's say, the, the premises. Or like I know your associate had to go to court and she made a point of – uh, when she was asked to describe something, she said it's it's beyond the scope. And I thought that was something also that I thought needed to be a part of today's conversation, just in case okay. somebody finds himself backed into a corner. Right. Essentially, there's there's two dangers there. In any place where drugs or anything else is illegal, if you let someone, a stranger, particularly a ho potentially hostile stranger into your abode, they can drop whatever the contraband is and then come back in and say, it's yours. It could be drugs. It could be child porn, whatever. Who knows? You're referring to entrapment. Right. Yes. However, it's like, gee. And then the other thing is they, they then, if they get, can get, can case the joint, they can get probable cause for a search warrant and come knock down the, the door later so to speak. So the reason I'm bringing this up is because there's this idea that when it comes to privacy, will the trustee or trustees plural, let's say if you pick two trustees in the future, let's say if you're going to form a trust, will they have the backbone to be able to have enough knowledge to kind of guard the castle or the fort and okay. not be so easily intimidated? Okay. And Angelina, three trustees are recommended, plus a trust protector, plus a trust bookkeeper, and an executive secretary and the general manager who makes the money for the trust, who could be actually the grantor, incidentally. Uh, it's very important that they be people of strong backbones and able to hold their own in con potential confrontations with various types of pe folks. Yes, yes. I, I know one of the points you also made is the older oftentimes the individual is, the more breadth and depth of experience they have to be an excellent trustee. Because another one of the responsibilities for a trustee is to generate income for the trust. So uh, go ahead. We, we do not use the I word. We only call it revenue. In fact, a properly constructed irrevocable car trust never has the I word, only increase and decrease in the trust corpus. And yes, by all means, and this goes to the procedures. If you have seasoned trustees, it's important that they be training their understudies. Because let's say you bring somebody in their 50s. They're going to perhaps work 20 more years. Are they finding someone to continue the legacy? Someone who they can take in and train 
in the proper procedures in order that they have the proper personnel later. Because yes. remember, this is a 60 to 80 year project to build that generational or legacy wealth. So I want to bring up another challenge, and I know I have limited time with you right now, but one of the other challenges oftentimes that people don't even think about, and this is where that emotional intelligence aspect comes in, but it's the baggage that people can have when they come together to form the trust or to manage it, um, being in the sense of even just finding two people to trust or being able to work through and process the internal baggage if there's going to be fights or squabbles. I took a workshop with a fellow named Nikki Nimeroff, who I lost track of uh, back in California. This was in Huntington Beach, I think, when I lived in Orange County years. This is 30 years ago, Angelina. And he made his living originally as a golf coach to business people. Then he became a business coach because he was looking to a an, an A in accounting, not a book. It was not a, they book a bunch of bookkeepers, et cetera. And he said, what are the goals of this organization? Four partners. Three partners had one set of goals, which were compatible. And the fourth one had a completely different set of goals. So it's important that that people sub understand the goals and support the goals, which ought to be specified in the trust indenture. Well, absolutely. And again, it shifts from this mentality of scarcity or me, me, me to one of what works for the group and cohesion. So even just starting with a family unit, whether somebody's within a family business or they just come across wealth, they can start to think in a group mentality, even when there's differences. Like, uh, Howard, I might disagree with you, but I could still appreciate what it is that you would like to see as a goal for, let's say, the overall family legacy. And I think that's where that emotional intelligence and emotional literacy comes in to know how to bridge that divide so that there doesn't have to be those squabbles. Most people flop because of lack of EQ, not IQ. In other words, most people have the smarts to succeed. They get in their own way. What's the old Pogo quote? We have met the enemy and they are us. And that's true. It's, it's important that you check your ego at the door. Yes, yes. Well, I, I wanted to bring that up because there's an aspect of trust that are that legal conversation. But then there's another aspect that's the human nature conversation of how do we all get along and play nice and not, you know, for lack of a better expression, poke each other's eyes out over, um, well, somebody got such, such more and I didn't get the this and the and and then it, it yeah, I because it, it could come up, and I'm going to bring up the banking conversation in a moment, but these are the distinctions that are really important. For example, like the beneficiary can have use of the trustee's car. Uh, the beneficiary can have a credit card that the trustee pays off, but they can't have the debit card. So these are all those fine lines that one needs to understand that your two books or your organization's two books cover um, that I think is if somebody's going to do it right in terms of trust to know exactly uh, the the history, the procedures, uh, the do's and the don'ts, so that it can just be easy. It doesn't have to be hard. And they can pass on that that wealth so that the next generation can have a few coins in their pocket and then have that time that I referred to before about you know setting aside time for self-exploration compared to just being on the mouse wheel 24 hours, seven days a week for their entire lifetime. This is the idea of the Irrevocable common law trust staff finding opportunities for people to express themselves. Some people may be a good artist, and that will not typically show up uh, in a government school system. It's not something that, unless, unless someone's exceptionally talented, they're not going to come to the fore. And that's the that's simply the way it goes. And if you can again, Frank Ozak suggested, hey, let's set up a situation where the person has the opportunity to work in five or six positions for six months. Because the first two days you may be lost. However, I mean I've been in situations where I was at a place for three or four days, I could see this is not gonna work. 
it's usually obvious sometimes it's usually obvious if it's going to be a horrible situation early on however if it's promising it's like hey it give it four or five six at the minimum and says hey i like this and I, i'd like to change this again you make those modifications again that's a, that key thing that those mentors this is the most important thing that people do not get in the united states and canada that i know is unless you're from the upper class you do not have mentors to a great extent particularly in the united states and canada you're which is a whole nother discussion for, for the males it, it doesn't is it doesn't exist anymore mentorship. that's sad yeah mentorship very important well it needs to i had a mentor and it's uh vital it's I mean, you watch that person and they model it and it's wonderful. But that's incidentally, that's the successful recovery from any addictive behavior is by modeling someone who has managed to do a, a recovery. Uh, sure. Or they have a skill set that you'd like to have, but it's one thing to read it uh, maybe in a book, theoretically. It's a whole other thing to be able to shadow that person and to understand how do they handle conflict and how do they solve problems and how do they finesse difficult situations? Yes. As the sage of Philadelphia said, the, the, the punchline is involve me and I understand. Very important. Yes. I want to ask you two more questions if I can, before I ask you about your holistic legacy, which is the banking conversation. So oftentimes when somebody would like to open up a bank account in a trust, it is the trustee that needs to go into the bank. The bank may never know who the grantor is and they don't have to know who the beneficiaries are, but it can be handled in such a way, I have it written down here, such that perhaps they have the uh, registration number on the birth certificates or some other way so that if one day the beneficiaries do have to walk into the bank, it could be one strategy compared to just volunteering their names. What say you? That's an interesting comment, Angelina. Yes, by all means, it's important that some person be able to. It's a very important that to track the beneficiaries because that's the 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 key thing. Is every trust is all about the beneficiary. It's not about anything else, as Gwen Wyckoff would say. Only the trustees may open a bank account, and in a local common law trust, the grantor is never the trustee because that makes it a grantor trust or some other type of trust, typically a grantor trust, especially in North America. Yes, it's it's very important that that be happened, and that's part of the trust institutional knowledge. And by all means, it's important to make sure if everything goes to whatever and everybody gets kidnapped by Apaches, that there be some way to get at least get the assets, the remainder, to the beneficiaries, whatever is most appropriate. Again, without sacrificing the privacy of the trust and especially and the assets and the beneficiaries yes yes well i think that this is uh just uh, one of those important distinctions because sometimes people don't know uh, gosh i would like to have a bank account in the name of the trust and you know who needs to do what what is it that they need to know and what paperwork do they need to bring into the bank and also what to redact or withhold and i think that the, the two books cover this. So if somebody would like to learn more, uh, that's one of the ways that it can become relevant in their life. It's not just this faraway concept that they build it out for two years and put it on the shelf. This is something that they could uh, transfer their vehicles or cars into their um, uh, you know paint collection, their racehorses, and even have a separate trust for each asset. Typically, solely as a paralegal, Inactive assets are held in a holding trust, and it's very important that when you go into a bank, you be very well dressed. And you're professional. Be, yeah, but very very well dressed. In other words, you're talking about at least a sports coat, tie, suit preferred. Uh, and in North America, it's best to open. My in my experience. And I went in with Frank Ozak to open one account. Uh, you you walk in with at least a thousand bucks to open the account. I'm, many will do it with less, a hundred bucks, two hundred. Walk in with a thousand. Let the bank know you are serious. 
about this financial account. Yes, yes. And also, if somebody, uh, again, wants to know how do they create a bank account and not have it in their individual name, that this is a possibility and this is one of the right. things that a right. trust does allow for. So I'd like to ask uh, you one more question. Uh, Go ahead, let, please. And leave a question. Is it, this is further covered in the premium subscription newsletter, $80 for a year at www.passingboat.com. That's a separate purchase. And that comes yeah. out every other month, uh, usually on the first, except never April first. Always April second. Yes, because well, you I never do anything serious on April the first. Yeah, yeah. March thirtieth or April second. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. Go ahead. Andrew. Well, I think one of the 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 uh, distinctions distinctions that you're pointing to is public and private, and there's only so much we're going to discuss on this public venue, and then the rest of it needs to be private okay. conversation. And so I'm kind yeah. of just touching upon some key points here. Just uh, the, the trustee is the bridge between the public and the private. The, that is why it's very important the trustees be of the utmost character and integrity. Because they, in, in effect, have a foot in two worlds. And, and to understand both public and private. And again, that's not oftentimes covered in university or even with uh, traditional law schools. So, okay. Well, I know that I have to be respectful of your schedule. So, Howard, would you please share what a holistic legacy means to you and what you would like your legacy to be? I would, my goal is to be recognized as one of the foremost educators in the field of the irrevocable common law trust such that we can provide a win-win situation provide generational and legacy wealth by providing proper personnel procedures and resources and avoiding the the situation of rags to riches, to rags in three generations, which is all too common in North America and elsewhere. It's a great tragedy. Well, it is. And I think uh, it one of the reasons is because of the lack of knowledge and then being able to apply year after year and stay on top of it regarding the education and the practices. Correct. I, 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 I concur completely. And what values, core values, do you get to honor by thinking about your legacy and developing it and executing it. I firmly believe in playing win-win games when they're available. And it is truly sad that most people play either lose-lose games or win-lose games. Well, I, I take after the great mathematician and computer scientist John Neumann in that way is yes, gee, these are available. Might as well take advantage of it or might as well do something with it. That's lovely. Thank you so much, Howard. I know one of the points that your associate uh, Gwen made was in terms of children and understanding that um, oftentimes um, when people don't have the knowledge, they don't have the vision and families can easily you know, break themselves down, let alone what society can do today regarding the lack of support. Again, that is lack of proper personnel. It's absolutely vital to get the best people that you have and you can find. And indeed, quite frankly, pay them handsomely because they deserve it. Yes. Um, so in closing, I would like to say that uh, one of the key points that we weren't able, able to cover, but I think is key, is oftentimes there needs to be a leader within the trust, whether that's the executive secretary, or if it is just somebody who has uh, innate leadership skills. And that's also so that's something that's covered in the two books. But I want to give the last word to you. So what would you like to close us out with, Howard? The key person is the person that produces the money, the general manager. That is the driver of the trust, the key person, because that basically uh, the, the, the resources allow it to all to happen, allows to set up the proper procedures and lets you to get the proper personnel. So that's the critical person. You're, and that can, again be, can be the grantor. However, the critical item is 
find that person who can get the revenue and increase, increase the cross corpus. In other words, you get you can get that third or fourth generation that has that generational or perpetual wealth. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for uh, speaking into the distinctions between a statutory trust and then the common law irrevocable trust so that people know that there's different options um, regarding how they would like to uh, formulate their legacy from a legal perspective. And again, I set the context that we're just two friends talking in a virtual coffee shop. This is not to be construed as legal, tax, financial, or investment advice, but something maybe to have somebody ponder upon in what somebody might say garden variety information. So I just want to put that disclaimer out there. And having said that, that there is this knowledge. And just like somebody wrote the book Catcher in the Rye at one time, it was taboo. But um, I think as society evolves, we want to grow and learn. And those of us that are willing to do the work, those resources are there and the individuals that have gone before us as pioneers so that we don't have to discover all the answers ourselves, the case law and so forth. So so I guess that those are my closing thoughts. And um, so for anyone who's listening, um, please remember to like and subscribe if you're on YouTube or if you're tuning in on Apple Podcasts, please remember to rate and review. Thank you so much for joining us this week. And thank you, Howard, for speaking into generational wealth in the context of legacies.